thanks, uh, thanks for coming. Um, so my name is Benjamin Hodge, um, if you're not aware. Was anybody in my talk yesterday? Okay, good. We can start fresh. Um, so today I want to talk about building your first pipeline uh, or release pipeline in Azure. Um, this really came about uh, through a few things. Also, if my slides look a little bit non-traditional or strange, uh, check out what a sketch note is. I found out about this like a week ago and redid all my slides with like nice pretty pictures, which I really like. So the only thing is sometimes it doesn't show so well, so I apologize. But um, yeah, this came about from a, a couple of uh, challenges and things we've, we found. So I'll talk a little bit around the thinking behind this. But really the idea was to have uh, a very basic release pipeline uh, just based on PowerShell and Azure with no other dependencies. Uh, so we'll go through that, we'll build a new site, we'll update the application, we'll test the application, we'll roll back uh, and sort of show you the, the workflow that's happening there. So really, the, the driver behind this was when you're looking to get started, if you don't have a release pipeline, if you even maybe don't have a lot of automation or scripts uh, and you don't have necessarily uh, kind of DevOps buy-in and culture, but you're looking to improve the way you manage and, and operate your environment, you kind of get faced really suddenly with all these new things, right? All these new tool sets, people are recommending different build servers, do I use Jenkins, Team City, TFS? Uh, you can spend a year just trying to get your head wrapped around all these different pieces, right? Uh, I spoke yesterday about the idea of just enough infrastructure, having just enough infrastructure around your application to deliver it, to start, and then go over and improve it. But if you try to build this like, big, huge thing in your head, you'll never get started and you'll probably build the wrong things and then you'll have to back out of it because you don't have enough knowledge about what your, what your requirements are yet. So really this came about from sort of saying, how can we, how can we do something better? How can we get started? But how can we do it just using PowerShell um, and, and Azure so that the, the dependencies and the amount of things we need to manage is as low as possible? So this is pretty much it, right? We want to have our code packages, stick it in the pipe, have it come out the other end of Azure um, with our application, right? They're just as simple as that. Uh, so let's quickly deploy a new site. Uh, so at the moment, uh, we have two data centers, uh, each with two servers. Sorry, it's, I mean, I know you can't read it, but it doesn't, I, you, you don't really need to read it, um, but uh, yeah. Just to show that I'm not cheating. Okay, so there's four servers, two at each site. Uh, I have a Melbourne uh, and a Limerick-based uh, location, so we're going to deploy uh, in New York. Okay, so it's super boring. Um, that's going to go push an ARM template, stand that up in Azure, uh, and then uh, take all of the, the assets for the application, inject that in, do the build process on the servers, configure um, everything, uh, and we'll have a new location. So basically, we have a site like this. It's just a very basic kind of website. And I've just labeled each location, so it's kind of obvious where we are. Uh, so here, this is the New York or the US-based site, and at the moment, there's nothing there, right? So this is being built, and we'll end up with three, three sites like this. So this is all pretty much just based on ARM, uh, the Azure Resource Manager templates. Uh, it's all in JSON. Uh, we're also using JSON to manage our configuration data. Uh, again, the idea was to shrink the number of things we had to deal with. So we had to do JSON for ARM rather than use like PowerShell data structures or anything like that. We're already using JSON, keep everything in JSON. We can pass things the same way. Um, and then we, we did make some choices. I, I kind of spoke about this yesterday, but I'll cover it again since people weren't here because I think um, it was a pretty big mistake for us. Um, we did kind of commit to things like using the DSC for Linux extensions in Azure, like pretty early on. You can use them really easily. It gives you this nice DSC configuration management. 
Uh, but then we had a lot of problems with certain packages. It wasn't quite working well. Then we had problems with the extension installation. Uh, and we had to back out of that and sort of undo a whole ton of work. So really, the way that, um, the way that we're managing the actual configuration of the servers is really just to use posh SSH to um, inject a bootstrap script that just downloads everything from Azure storage and runs some bash scripts um, to do it. And you could do the same thing, obviously, uh, using PowerShell scripts. So we've kind of separated the logic of deploying to the platform and configuration management much better. Uh, and that's really paid off because even things like now we want to start doing Vagrant-based dev builds on their own workstations. Uh, and that layer will still work on premise. It's not um, dependent on the platform. So um, yeah, that's, um, that's something also, I guess, related to that idea of just enough infrastructure. Even though there's best, best practices, if you try to kind of go all in all at once, you're probably going to make some bad choices and you're going to waste a lot of time undoing that. So anyway, that's going to stand up for a little while. Um, we'll come back to that uh, in a bit um, when that's ready. Um, so I just wanted to talk a little bit about the workflow we're using. Um, there's, I know there's a few guys in the room that are kind of doing this in like much bigger production, so we'd really like to have a discussion about um, how people are handling this. But pretty much um, we have one ARM template that builds test, which is just a, a single multi-role server really just testing the application. And then we have staging and production. Staging and production use the exact same template file just with their own parameters so we guarantee it's the exact same document and the exact same settings rather than have even we don't even have two copies of the file they build from the exact same file um, and then what we basically do is we roll the application forward so we roll the application from testing when it passes into staging into production and then we back propagate the production data so from production we propagate back to staging back to test so when we're testing we're actually testing on as close as possible to the la latest data set um, and then uh, I also spoke a bit yesterday about um, we'll see when we do the rollback the idea of um, blue green deployments and also um, always doing fresh builds so we don't do in-place upgrades of the servers. We just build a new server and shut the old server off uh, and put it in place. And then we can also like roll back because we still have that. So you don't have to worry about really complex rollback things at the application layer. It's always a fresh, clean build. But that is really difficult at the data layer. Like you can't just trash a production database. Um, so handling and managing persistent data is still kind of a challenge. Um, you can put abstractions around it and APIs around it if you kind of get to that stage, but um, this is pretty much hooked straight in uh, to SQL. So I don't know, has anyone kind of like significantly got a different workflow to that? Yeah, yeah. Okay, doing it vaguely right, good. <laughs> um, let's just see if that's, okay. So that looks good. So let's just zoom in a bit. Nope, that's the wrong hotkey. There we go. Okay. So, I mean, I'm just splatting stuff to the screen, right? Basically, we just went, built a new um, location in Azure, configured our servers, um, and our deployment's done. And then let's see if that actually loads, because that'll be the... Hey! Okay. Whew! Demo number one, tick. All right, so now, uh, and you can see if I just kind of, again, enumerate through um, the server resources there, there's now six, right? So these are the ones in the new application. So let's just say we've, been, we've got a new package from development, they've got a new version of the application, we want to update that, right? We need to track and manage our assets and our artifacts and update them, and then also have a process for you know, rolling out the new application. So. Um, this will publish all the new artifacts um, up to Azure storage uh, and then uh, we can actually go through the process of building new servers with the new version, putting them in and then um, we use load balancing in front just to change the active server in the pool so we redirect users and traffic from the, the current system to the one we just built, right? 
So while that's running, I want to talk a little bit about um, managing, like kind of managing your artifacts and your assets. Uh, again, like import anyone doing this, like really open to ideas. Um, so you've got application files or application assets that are directly coming from development, and then you have a whole bunch of assets that are related to your operational tasks, right? Um, now, best practice is that they should be in the same repository, but we found that does, that works if you have service-based teams or product-based teams where you're only kind of using artifacts that directly apply to that app. But if you've got a shared operations team and you have things where you're managing multiple kind of product or dev streams, um, that well, it just got tricky for us to conceptualize like where things belong and you end up with things really scattered around and we, we didn't come up with a good system for it. So we actually keep all of the infrastructure code in its own repository. And the other thing was, especially like coming, not coming from a dev background, the maturity level around Git and like managing that, it was just kind of safer to get people started and they weren't worried about like kind of screwing up commits on development branches and dealing with that. So that's how we handled it. We actually have two separate ones. I think, you know, maybe as we get better at this, we'll, we'll work out how to manage that better and we can integrate it in. Uh, but for now, um, we don't. So where we actually merge all of the artifacts and assets is one, when we start publishing it. And all we have is some blob storage in Azure um, with containers for each environment. And what we basically do is um, when there's a new version that gets published into test, if test passes, we then um, move those assets into the staging container. So we're just um, moving and propagating the files through those different folders. And then each environment takes the artifacts from that. The only exception to that is environmental configuration data. So there's unique data um, in each of those environments. Um, so they don't get copied across, right? They're unique. Um, to each. And even managing that, you need to kind of think about, again, because we automate that duplication. So when I say like update my build artifacts, that whole rolling process is all automatic. But you need to kind of think in your head about what files move forward and what files kind of stay there. But then also make sure that you're updating them. So you might need to change a staging configuration file for that version of the application. But you need to publish the staging copy, not the test copy. Um, I kind of don't like that because it still it's still feels like that actual change skips testing because it like goes straight in, but it's specific like configuration data. One thing we do do is we use the exact same configuration data in staging and production. So we have the same IP ranges and everything. Everything is exactly the same and duplicated. So um, they're not really compatible with each other if they're on the same infrastructure, but it helps because yeah, you, you kind of, again, using the same assets and files, so it at least gets a little bit of a test. Um, and then we haven't really done this yet, but um, I think we should also have an archive. So once it goes from production, rather than override everything, it should flow through, and then we should be saving previous builds, at least like back a couple. Um, just in case we find something later where we need to roll back or investigate something. Um, but at the moment, pretty much after production, um, we keep that server and like until the next one rolls over it, and then we just trash it and kill it, and we sort of lost that forever. Um, you can always go back to source, I guess, and rebuild, but um, you don't necessarily have all of the assets. Uh, okay. So again, just some nice, exciting text splattered on the screen. Um, that says it's kind of installed everything um, across all the environments. So let's see if that actually works. Okay, and just be really clear, that's meant to happen. Okay, it's meant to break. So you push out an update. Um, it wasn't meant to happen when it happened in Melbourne, but I thought it was actually awesome that it broke before the rollback, so now I do it on purpose. But okay, you push it out. Things went wrong, right? Um, you're not really sure why. I do have, I wrote this while I was waiting for everybody. Um, you obviously should be kind of testing and validating automatically, um, but get 
Like my web page status 200 is not a test. Like that's not enough. You can see like all those tests pass, but the app is obviously broken. So if you're going to automate off your, if you're going to trust your tests to like make decisions about things flowing forward, which we don't, this is all manually triggered. Um, it's almost if you're not going to test properly, don't do tests. Like don't fool yourself that you have tests, right? Just just know that, oh my God, we have no testing. We have to really be careful and don't have that full sense of security. Then go do your testing properly. Because um, we had a couple of times where, yeah, we had some versions and someone just basically splashed up the home screen and went, yeah, it's all good. Like, keep going. Go, 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 go. And then you log in and the database isn't there and nothing logs in right. And um, yeah, just so a word of warning just kind of pinging an endpoint or doing a GET request um, doesn't really classify as, as testing. But obviously what you would want is to have a whole bunch of automated testing, probably around like Pester and um, OVF framework uh, that validates what's, what's happening. So what we do is um, we do a blue-green deployment model, which I think I have. Yeah, that's not a test. Don't do that. Um, I'm going to trigger the rollback in a sec, but I just want to kind of walk through it. Yeah, sorry, this one doesn't show very well. So what we do, it, it's sort of a variation of blue-green um, in that like, we don't have two versions running side by side in parallel, like doing A-B testing or anything. But we basically just have this, um, we build a new server. Um, the, the current version, if, if that was N, right? We keep n plus 1, so it's still sitting there. We can roll back to it if we need to. After that, it'll get trashed. And we build a new one, and then we just kind of roll everything forward, and we do that at the load balancing layer, just changing what the active server is, um, and then deleting and then rebuilding um, back at the beginning, and we just cycle through. So if something goes wrong, uh, we pretty much just hit the back switch, uh, and at the load balancing layer, switch the active server back to that previous one. So um, you saw it, I don't know, how long did it take to update? Okay, like three or four minutes to update, but uh, restore is literally like a couple of seconds. Okay, so everything should be rolled back. So we don't actually, we're not trying to like rebuild the old version. We just kept the old server. And um, what we did is just here in the virtual service, you can see one's enabled and one's disabled in the pool. We just switch that. We just flick um, which one is directing traffic. These are just single servers, but these could be server pools, right? You could do this at a, at a larger scale. So that makes it really, really, really fast to flick back. Um, and you can kind of really mitigate a lot of the risk around that. But the, the thing that keeps coming up for me is I, I completely get this with web applications, but I have no idea how to get these kind of benefits in like, you can't do this for your SAP farm or like your exchange CAS servers like this. You can't just build a new farm or build a new CAS server side by side. Um, if you're trying to do updates and things like that. So it's, it's a great model uh, and definitely has a lot of value, but I'm, I'm not sure how you do that in more legacy enterprise workloads. Um, you'd need to find a different way to, to think about that. Um, yeah. Oh, demos, all worked. Whew. Going good, yes. Yeah, so um, what, what we currently do is we do actually have like short maintenance windows where we bleed users off and then we flick over. Um, we, we do do that through the load balancer. So what we can do is like we can bring them up active active for a short period of time. Um, no new requests will be sent to the, the old server. All new requests will go there. Um, but w we do try to bleed them all off first because we don't have a good protection around the data. So we're more worried, like 
we're worried about if we have both front ends talking to the back end. Like, yeah. Um, so we we use like our own load balancers. Um, Azure, and actually there's a reason for that. So like Azure load balancing and things, it's not quite as granular. Um, and it is a little bit harder to like bring things in and out of a pool. You just, you just have to like start failing the health check. Whereas here we can sort of, we can say, okay, when this is disabled, like for the next five minutes, like whoever's on there, keep serving them. You just don't let any new requests. And then at the end of that, like send a reset and like do a hard force and things like that. And then um, we don't use Azure DNS because we also have like our own global site load balancing. So we can do like sticky DNS or GOP based routing and things like that to other locations. So we're using that um, as well. Yeah. So I, I can't, I'm not really sure what you can do within in Azure. Um, but for us, we do, um, we do location based. So just the, like three major regions, basically. Um, you have to be a bit, does anyone do geo IP based resolution? So just, um, it sounds really cool. And you're like, yeah, that's awesome. We can build our own like content delivery network. Yeah, 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 it's like great. Um, but the thing is the, the IP that the geo data comes from is not like your user's laptop, it's their DNS resolver. So if everybody uses Google 8.8.8.8 for their DNS, everybody goes to the US data center. And at the same time, if you're trying to be really granular and you've got locations that are really close together, even though that site IP address like can be distinguished and you can do like closest line of sight, again, they're probably both going to a, like a telco upstream DNS and they're gonna look like they're in the same location. So you need to really understand how the DNS resolution is happening. If you can force the namespace so you can get around it by like forcing, for that namespace you can force your, like say you're using AD DNS, you can force them to directly look up um, against the, like the GSLB service for that namespace and not go to their normal um, upstream resolver, and that way you get the actual site IP address directly. So there's ways you can do that through like conditional folding and things like that, but you need to be really aware of it. And we have had customers who couldn't, like they couldn't control that DNS infrastructure, so they couldn't, or they're like, yeah, that's like a six month change request to do that, and just kind of expecting some magic. So you kind of get into the weeds around the DNS protocol processes when you start doing that. So it, it does work and it, it, it's cool, but um, there's, there's cases where there's a lot of assumptions around it basically, like the geodata is not this system, it's, it's coming from the DNS. Um, so I actually wanted to spend like a fair bit of time kind of talking about this a little bit more as well and, and um, kind of people's thinking. And I, I kind of did this I kind of did this because we were stuck and it, it kind of made sense, but the more people I've been speaking to today, kind of struggling with the same thing, how to get started without learning a thousand new things. So I don't know, would anyone be interested in like me putting this up on GitHub and kind of abstracting it a bit where it's reused? Like under the, under the hood, there's all this magic that is only relevant to us, but it's not that hard to abstract the workflow um, where you basically can just push stuff to Azure storage for your assets use ARM for deployments. We can put in Pester as a testing framework. Um, it wouldn't be that hard to make this generic if people kind of think that would be useful. What I really liked about this is it's manual. So we trigger everything manually. So we can like see it and validate it because we know like we don't have the testing around it for it to be safe to do it really high speed. But at the same time, because it's, it, there's a structured workflow um, it's controlled, it's still, all of the actions are still automated other than actually triggering a new workflow. And we have those high level like wrapper functions that ensure the workflow underneath um, is right. And the only thing we need is, yeah, some JSON for ARM templates and PowerShell. 
that there's no other dependencies whatsoever. You don't need to learn anything new, um, but it's way safer than manual releases. Again, if you were um, at my session yesterday, I, I told the story of the time I deleted the production database, which was a couple of weeks ago, but it's like a one meg database and the first, work the first step in every workflow is backup production database. So we, we back up the database, we push that um, again into a container and every environment when we're doing builds, builds from that data set. So that's where we're guaranteeing that we're using like a relevant data set. So if we build a test server, the first thing it does is back up the production database, publish that, and then the build starts and sucks that down. And if we go to staging, it'll do the same thing. So that's always fresh. And again, I just changed it to also start keeping previous copies. So if the backup breaks something, we don't suddenly have trash in the backup. Uh, so we invested really heavily on automating protections first. So as we started to speed up other things, if we broke it, yeah, it's like a one meg database. And instead of taking me 15 minutes to do this release, it took me 45, but it wasn't a big deal. Um, and then this morning, um, one of the guys <laughs> was talking about a time he deleted like a terabyte of production databases at a customer. Um, so he won. That was a way cooler story than mine. Um, yeah, so I was thinking more and more that like this, I think this would be a really useful model for like starting off, trying to get some kind of pipeline, learning more about the, the workflow. And then if you want to speed it up, it's really easy to just put this into scheduled tasks or start hooking it some other way, um, putting it into like a chat bot, right, to, to trigger workflows. But it's, it's pretty low maintenance. Um, we've learned a lot doing it and now we understand more what the role of something like Jenkins is in the process, where configuration management should hook in and what we want to do with configuration management and what we don't want to do with configuration management. Because again, it's not necessarily a silver bullet that's just gonna, you end up managing your config management instead of anything else. And then we were really focused on building a pipeline for the app and we completely underestimated the amount of work in building and controlling our tools that manage the app. So you, you kind of, for every application pipeline, you've got your operations pipeline, you're trying to control your tools. Um, I had to rewrite some of this code um, last week because something just started happening with Azure commandlets, right? It's not Azure, it's, it's my client, but it just broke a whole bunch of stuff. And we're, not, we're really dependent on Azure and that's changing all the time. Um, and we're not testing that. We're not kind of keeping on top of like what versions of the modules we have, do they still work? Um, but that's a huge dependency that's kind of breaking things. And so now we need to think about how do we, how do we test and validate Azure and the Azure modules that all our stuff's sitting on? Um, so that's why the, the idea of just enough infrastructure is really important because the more infrastructure you have, the more you have to manage, the more complexity gets, and then you just go, you know what, this is just easier to click. Right, and you just keep clicking until you die. Um, okay, that's cool. I'll, I don't know. Should it be Posh Pipe or PS Pipeline? I can't decide. One is like kind of like shiny and corporate, and maybe easier to get your boss to approve. But Posh Pipe, I can just imagine a guy with like a big mustache and a little. Like it, it's more fun. It's more. It's more open sourcey. Um, Yeah, well, that's, I was, cause, so Chrissy was talking about her open source one. She's like, have a cool name, have a cool logo, get people excited, and they come like, like help, and it's like really cool. But then they sort of went, oh, but also, you know, if it's, you know, under a repo of at crazy, yeah, SQL with a bid, and you go to your boss and say, hey, we want to use this tool, they're like, no way, shut it down. So they set up um, a GitHub org with like DBA tools foundation or something like that. So it was kind of, you could actually use it. So that's why I was kind of thinking maybe like PS Pipeline or something, being a bit pragmatic, if you wanted to actually get this installed, um, it, it might be less of a sell, <laughs> right? Um, so I, I deliberately kind of left a fair bit of like free time in this um, to kind of, because you can see that, I mean, it's, it's, it's high level workflows, right? There's a whole bunch of kind of spinning wheels underneath. Um, to kind of see where people, what people wanted to talk about. And I mean, okay, not you guys, but how many people are using a, a release pipeline already? Yeah. And uh, what are you using 
for that? What kind of tools are you using? JPEGs. Yeah, okay. Does, does anyone else kind of understand what I mean when I said like it was kind of really overwhelming to get started? Like just, okay, like just shut IT ops down for two years while we learn all this stuff. We'll come back and like do it then. Yeah, so I don't know. Is this a kind of useful, I guess, thought process or like to get started? Do you think you could kind of start implementing this around maybe like one small? Yeah, okay, that's cool. Good, okay, I'm glad that's, so okay, I'll, I'll set up a repo and maybe stick it in the chat um, the Slack channel um, for that. But so are you guys, is anybody looking, like do you already have kind of agreement to do some kind of release pipeline model? Or it's just like not on the, not on the table, not on the, yeah, yeah. So that, so that was it, so like, uh, I'm not in IT ops, right? This is not my job, right? Um, so we, we were trying to, like our customers are doing this and we have to support them and we have to like operate in their environment. So it's really important that we understand the environment and the customers we're trying to serve. So we deliberately build, built this as a pilot project to put all our customer support, professional services, sales engineering, even QA and dev through this process as operators and running like a DevOps operation so that they understand the real world challenges. And that's why we really want to expose the pain. We didn't want to just come in, install a bunch of tools, like, cause we do, we do like release pipelines and stuff in dev. Like we, we have people that could set this up in like five minutes, right? That's not the point. The point's to go through the thought process and actually to go through the pain like, oh yeah, we do that because if you don't do that, you delete the production database. Okay, we get it now, right? So like we didn't have a staging environment. Somebody said, oh, staging just seems like a bunch of extra Azure stuff, right? Like, why, why do we need to do it twice, right? We already did tests, like this is stupid. And I sort of said, oh, well, it's, it's like obviously best practice. Everybody who's doing this is doing it. But I couldn't really articulate why staging was important. Like, it was, okay, fine, whatever, right? Let's just go. So we didn't do staging and it was okay because in the beginning we just had like a single server. Everything was integrated on one server. So when we built one server in test and we built one server in production, it was the same stuff. Then production got more and more complicated. We split out the database and the front end. We started to have the load balances and the, the blue green deployments. And then all of a sudden something broke because staging is to test your operational workflow. You test the code already but you don't test it in a production-like environment and you're not testing your tools and your processes and your workflows until they hit production. So that's the purpose of staging, right? Is to test, you're testing a different thing. Um, and now I can, if somebody says, hey, staging seems like a bunch of waste of time, I can say, oh no, like this is really important for these reasons. So this was specifically designed as part of this. And so um, we have all our guys doing tours of duties where they're, like they have to run this environment. It's a real application internally. It, it provides um, utilities and tools for our support teams to do um, analysis and things for customers. So if you screw up, like it, it's real, it does hurt. And when you delete the database, you go, oh, I live in Sydney, no one's awake yet. Yay, <laughs> do, 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 nobody will ever know. Um, but it's not like gonna kill the company, it's not gonna like impact finance, it's not gonna take down any customers. So it's dangerous enough to like be real and, and have real constraints and, and lessons around it, um, but not so dangerous that while we're learning, yeah, we're gonna like shut the company down or something. Um, and I think that was a really good model, like not to just try and go, oh, okay, we're gonna take over like the finance system, the ERP system, like let's go, right? Install the DevOps, go. Um, so I would definitely recommend that. And so yeah, like from a time perspective, we all have other duties and like customer duties and um, all kinds of stuff. And we have families and all that kind of thing. So this is, that was also part of it is the faster you get this working, all that pressure goes away because 
you know, all of those manual deployments you're doing, staying late, waiting for outage windows, suddenly goes away, right? And it's not that you don't do any work, but now your work becomes making this better, like putting in more tests, putting in better workflows. And then just when you think you've got everything automated, development will say, hey, we completely redesigned the whole like topology of this and we want 18 more servers and logging and, and you start all over again, right? Um, or Azure changes their, their commandlet names happen just the other day, right? Oh, sorry, that doesn't exist anymore. Um, find, replace, find, replace. Yeah, so that idea of like we don't have time I think is like so easy to get caught up, but it's it's like you don't have time not to do this. Like it's it's just getting worse and worse every day and somehow just like pushing stuff back a little bit every day just to even this workflow like took us a long time to, to kind of get this. And actually right now for us, this is broken. Like I can't release at the moment, right? Something broke. This is this is like a toy. I copied it and changed a bunch of stuff and it looks nice, but it's just a demo. It's not even worth looking at the code because it's just a bunch of hacky stuff, right? So getting this took a long time, but like even now something's broken, we've got to go back, analyze it, fix it, and kind of keep it going. But you don't have to start. So it could be something as simple as every time we release, we just have one function that backs up the production database before we start. Then we go manual again. And then you go, okay, there's, there's 20 steps in this workflow and every week you just automate one of them. And then when the automation ends, you go manual again, but you chip away, right? And then you can improve. And I think that's the really dangerous mindset of until it's perfect, I, won't, I can't start. Or I can't start until I have time for all of it. And then that's where you just get overwhelmed and it's crazy pressure and you get into the day to day. So the way we thought about it, even with DSC, when we started adopting it, um, all the applications are Linux based. So we have bash scripts that do everything. And I was like, okay, just every release, put one more package into a DSC config and then the bash script runs after DSC. So you just, chip away at it, right? And then you get a package that for some reason doesn't install. So you just troubleshoot that. And all we did was like every line in the bash script, we just worked on getting that into configuration management and out of that and ran them in parallel. And the idea was that that bash script would one day just be empty, right? Um, so there's, I think there's lots of useful things you can take away from that. And like I said, invest first in the protections, like backing things up, checking things as you're going you get straight away, you get some benefit, but also then when you try to speed up and automate, you, you're gonna screw up, you're gonna point at the wrong server or do the wrong thing, you've already got all the protections. So yeah, we have a policy, every single workflow script, the first line is backup production database. Like it's just always done. Um, and another thing that somebody, I forget who it was, I think it was Rob said he does in staging, which I really liked is he tests rollback in staging. So he updates and then he rolls back. So he's testing that his rollback is working before he goes to production, which I really like. That's, that's like excellent. So every single staging release also tests his roll, rollback. Because um, again, things are going to change. Your rollback might work today and then next week, yeah, some, you know, your app breaks and your workflow breaks at the same time and you're screwed. So, um, I don't know. Have you got? Because you've got a, a TFS-based pipeline, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, are you got a? Is there like a similar kind of process that you guys are using to think about from an ops side? Yeah, actually, they're, like, they're good questions. Um, the, I think what we like have really got out of this, and 
Um, anyone who was at Gale's um, presentation talked about Conway's law. Um, they also talk about that in the DevOps um, uh, workbook. So Conway's law, and, it, and it's like very well studied that this this holds is the structure of the team or the organization's communications will dictate the structure of the systems they build, right? So the um, uh, the, the kind of example they use is all around a compiler, right? If you have like four developers or four teams of developers trying to build a compiler, you'll get a four pass compiler. You'll get a compiler that like does something, passes some data to something else, then runs it again. So if you have three, you'll get a three pass compiler, right? So as you, that's why um, Jeffrey talked about organizational silos. That's why they're really dangerous because when you have silos, you design processes and systems that work in silos. You don't have a smooth chain that goes through. So I think a good thing about this is the way we, we structured this helped us build that mindset and that understanding of the purpose of all of the tools. Um, and I think that was like a really key, again, a key reason for not getting focused on the tools, not getting focused on the tech, but getting focused on understanding the problem and the organizational kind of change and, and things like that. Um, in terms of what did we spend way too much time on, definitely on trying to do configuration management from day one, um, especially because we don't have that much stuff to, to manage. Um, yeah. We spent tons of time. I love DSC. I'm all about DSC. I want to use DSC. I want like Chef on it. Yay. But we we spent so much time instead of like even we were still doing we were still doing like probably 80% of the deployment manually, right? Because we were so focused on like just that like getting that bash script into config management, but not automating the actual deployment. Yeah. Like seriously. It was we had they were crappy scripts, but there were scripts that built the app. And instead of using them, we spent like probably three months trying to put that into config management, failed because then the extension stopped installing and had to back out of it anyway. Now the only thing we do is use PowerShell or SSH to take a bootstrap script, inject that, and then run all those scripts. And it works. It's like totally fine. And the developers, we just say, here are the scripts. So the way we do the, the scripting is we have three because they were just horrible the way the devs were doing it. It was blowing my mind. One for packages. So all it does is like load the packages. One for files. So the bootstrapper already makes sure all the assets are downloaded. So it's really staging files, like this needs to be copied into this folder, this permission needs to be changed. And then the last one is commands, which are things like restart this service, run migrations and things. And that's a nice workflow that I, I can also guarantee that I run packages, then I stage files, then I run like service commands and stuff like that. I know when I stage my files, the package has already been installed because a lot of time the the package sets up the folder, and I know when I run my like commands, the files and things are already in place. So I can force the devs like to guarantee me like a workflow that works, because they were installing a package, then staging a file, then resetting a service, then installing another package, and it just was really messy. So that's the structure we, we had. And now that we try to port that to other platforms as well, it's really easy. Um, so yeah, we, we wasted tons of time on that. And what was the third? We were trying to do something we could already do a different way instead of trying to like do something that we couldn't do yet, but which was way more value, right? Um, we could not do automated deployments. We could do automated app installation, right? We were just trying to do app installation with config management instead. But it wasn't adding a new ability. It wasn't speeding anything up. It was doing the same thing differently. Which now, if, if we have end-to-end -end builds, we can say, okay, we want to start triggering packaging and like that asset management into a build server instead of this way. 
And that is doing something that's already working in a different way, but it's, it's an evolution that gives us new benefit. But at the meantime, we can still deploy the app already. Like that bit's already happening. Now we have time to think about tooling and, and maturing it. But the thing has to be get that app from here like to there and installed fully automated end to end and that was the thinking behind this like what what's that minimal like smallest possible pipe that will pick this up and guarantee that it's installed there then kind of make the pipe like bigger stronger better so we yeah we definitely screwed that up yeah. oh yeah so number one like fix whatever's broken in this <laughs> So, okay, so this is sort of part, actually this works here because, um, yeah, I, I did it in a kind of simpler way, but um, what, this actually came out of what I've just finished doing, which was complete, completely refactoring like all our utilities. So, I'm a really big advocate for like good practices and this is a really great example of not following my own recommendations. Um, but I think it was also part of the process. What I normally say is, okay, I've got a solution and I map out and I model like the system that I'm trying to build. And then I map it to functions and then I go in and actually work out the implementation. The problem was because we couldn't like get this workflow clear in our heads, like we didn't know what we needed to code. It was impossible to kind of work out a module and what the function should be. Um, like I'm really happy how this has come out now and it looks really nice, but it was just doing my head and I couldn't, I couldn't work out the concepts. So we just were doing scripts. We just had like a big block script that we ran all in one go. And then what we were doing is just duplicating that and, and managing like um, environmental data in JSON. Um, but then there was some things we were adding all the time that weren't in the um, environmental data and hard coders had to copy and paste things. And basically, we got this big divergence where we had these massive scripts, one for each environment, doing this. And that broke, and it was completely, you, you couldn't diagnose it. So I refactored everything into a module and broke that down. So now we just call the workflow and we basically just say, like, deploy to test, deploy it. And, that and it brings in all the data and we can guarantee they're actually using the same version of the code and everything like that. We can wrap testing around it. We couldn't test any of our stuff because it wasn't written to be tested. It was just a script. Um, so finish that refactor um, will allow us more stability and then we have to do our testing. Like that test my app. Like So our testing is login, like make sure login works and then like we've got a few tests like, but it's basically smoke testing bring that into a proper pester framework and also st stop focusing on testing the app and start focus on testing our like workflow and utilities our code because that's we test the app we don't test our stuff so the next thing is definitely to to invest in testing Again, like we don't need new products. We don't need, sure, Jenkins, whatever, we can hook it up, but it's not gonna give us a new ability. Having tests that we can rely on, that's gonna add massive value. Um, so that's what we're focused on. And I'm planning to use either OVF or just straight pester for that, yeah. Um, we still have a little bit of time for questions, right? Yeah, um, any, yeah. I wish. <laughs> Sorry, continue. Yeah. 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 Oh, I, like, no, we will need to go to a continuous deployment tool. So this was meant to be like a bridging process. Um, for building trust, for building like the the organizational kind of like mindset, for kind of understanding the what I was really concerned about was like I could just go to QA and say build me a pipeline, go, 
and then go have a cup of coffee and then come back and it would be there. But in terms of like educating other parts, because I'm not worried about those guys, I want like my customer support teams and my sales engineers and my pro services guys to get this. In terms of educating them, in terms of getting them to kind of understand the pain customers are going through, and also a lot of the customers we're dealing with are going through the transformation, so they're making these mistakes. It wouldn't, like, sure, like you guys are kind of on top of it. It's more about iterating and improving. We we have one project um, which is like data center in a box, and they like they have a requirement to basically within two days time ship an Azure pack based like um, exchange Skype for business in a box, drop ship it anywhere in the world um, on demand. And um, they spend like so much time automating, like automate, 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 but they never kind of mapped out the workflow and planned it well. And it was meant to go live after like 24 months and it's nearly 36 months in and they haven't stood up a POC, right? Because they just, they didn't get, DevOps isn't automation, right? DevOps uses automation. Automation's a kind of solution to go this fast and, and bring stability, but just because you automate doesn't mean you're doing it right. Um, I was kind of saying to someone the other day, if you just automate what you're already doing now, you're just gonna build technical debt faster, right? Because you haven't got the mindset right. So it was really how to, how to get the guys kind of like thinking right, how to force ourselves to go actually to go through pain, like do manual deploys so you know how much this hurts, right? How much you hate at 10 p.m. at night after your day job trying to take this crappy code and make it stand up so you can go to bed. Like go through that, like hurt, right? Hurt bad, delete the production database, hurt, and then kind of understand like the purposing around it. So I think this gave us much better exposure to that. Whereas if we got the tooling, if someone just gave us this magic pipeline, we'd just be like, yeah, automation's cool. Like click, click, click. And we'd still be building crap, right? And just kind of relying on the pipeline to save us somehow. Um, so that was really the thinking. So I don't see this scaling um, to especially like, you know, yeah. Probably like a deployment a day would be okay, but I think if you started doing multiple deployments a day, you're just not gonna have the tracking and control, even just like visibility and reporting, right, of what's happening. Um, but by that stage, we will be more educated to make the right choices around it, and we'll have um, that in place. So there was always just a bridging exercise, a bridging exercise, yeah. And the skills. The guys just need PowerShell. I don't need to teach them like YAML and XML and like a thousand other things. There's like awesome tools and you just, just like managing data structures. It's just because, oh my God, like my brain hurts. Um, yeah. yeah. Cool. Anyone, any other questions before we wrap up? No? Okay. Thanks for staying awake after lunch and uh, walking so far to this room all the way over here. And uh, yeah, come, I'm, I'm around the rest of the day and uh, Come see me if uh, if I can help. Thanks.